is Jason with Meridio, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about what we're seeing in 2018 when it comes to not only display calibration, but full system calibration. What I mean by that is understanding the 18 gig infrastructure in order to pass HDR, 4K, wide color gamut signals, but also a little bit about uh, display calibration with, with HDR and just kind of some of the challenges that we're seeing in the field and and uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that we're seeing from a tech support standpoint. And I want to give you guys some uh, tips and tricks on, um, on how to handle some of these high bandwidth signals and uh, what to look for uh, from a calibration standpoint with some of the newer newer displays. So a little bit of housekeeping right away. Uh, again, my name is Jason uh, with Meridio, and I've got my colleague Tom. He is going to be manning the uh, chat box with us. So you will see that there is a, a question section in uh, in your presentation. Now, I will be checking that periodically through the presentation and uh, trying to answer some questions. Tom's going to do his best to answer some of those questions as well. But if neither Tom nor I get to eat any of your questions during the presentation, uh, we do have email addresses and we're going to be more than happy to uh, answer some of those questions um, after the webinar. Uh, the webinar will be recorded. So if you have any colleagues who uh, couldn't make it for the live presentation, then uh, we will have this recorded afterwards. So again, my name is Jason. I'm with Meridio, and I also uh, do some work with the Imaging Science Foundation. Um, I've been into AV my entire life. I've always had a passion for audio equipment and video equipment. I love music and I love movies. I uh, decided to turn it into a job. So in 1999, I started working in the AV space, um, did a lot of installation work and a little bit of sales work. Uh, around 2008, I went to my first ISF class and absolutely fell in love with uh, with the whole uh, video side of things. Um, I calibrated a few thousand TVs in, in, in about a seven-year span. And in 2012, I started teaching the class. And um, I, I just really love this work, guys. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's challenging. Things change quite a bit. Keeps me on my toes. And uh, there's nothing more fun than popping in, you know, a brand new, brand new movie and having it look and, and sound, sound incredible. It's all part of the experience for me. Uh, things we're going to talk about today a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, calibration methods in 2018, like I mentioned before. We're going to talk quite a bit about 18 gig infrastructure, making sure we're getting the right picture to the display that we're working on. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about different troubleshooting tools that we use uh, to uh, troubleshoot video systems and to make sure that we are getting the right picture out of each component and the right picture to the display. And uh, towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about calibrating um, HDR signals and HDR televisions and displays. That seems to be such a hot topic nowadays uh, because uh, you know we've just uh, just started really getting into calibrating HDR. And there's a lot of questions. There's new methods uh, for people who've been calibrating. You know, for a couple years at least, uh, you will learn some new things when when it comes to calibrating HDR. So how did we get here? Um, it's a great question. You know, we have. Um, uh, Meridio has a full tech support department, and we take calls every day on, you know, I've got an, I've got a uh, 4K Blu-ray player, I've got a 4K movie in there, but I can't get 4K to the display. The display is not going into the 4K HDR mode. Uh, things like, you know, we're using an extender, and we can't seem to get the uh, 4K to pass through the extender or the matrix switch or um, just all kinds of different things, and probably some of the stuff you guys are seeing in the field as well. Uh, so, like I said, I want to give you some tips and tricks on how to work around uh, and how to work with 18 gig infrastructure and how to work around uh, legacy systems. So, let's say, for example, you have a system that's already installed in a home or in a business and they don't have an 18 gig infrastructure. Can we still get 4K and HDR signals to the display? Sure, we can. And uh, again, we'll talk about some tips and tricks on how to make 4K and HDR work in legacy systems as well. So, a couple of things about 4K uh, just right off the bat. Um, there's, uh, like I said before, there's a lot of angst and anxiety around 4K. Um, it's new. It's it's brand new to a lot of people. And, um, you know, dealing with these high bandwidth signals, it's not just kind of plug and play like it always has been. Uh, you do have to worry about uh, configuring components and configuring the display and configuring inputs. And things like firmware updates are super critical. Um, if anyone remembers back in the day when 3D TVs and, and things were new, there was a movie, Avatar, that would not play on a lot of uh, Blu-ray players until the Blu-ray player was updated. And we're seeing that more and more now with, with HDR as well. So doing things like firmware updates are super critical. Um, that's usually the first thing I do when I come into a system is make sure everything's firmware updated. Um, we also want to make sure we are managing our EDIDs. Um, you know, if there's an EDID mismatch between a display and a component, 
Uh, we could have no 4K, we could have no HDR, we could have no signal, we could have no sound, all kinds of different things. So uh, EDID management is very critical these days. Um, every component might need to be calibrated. It's not just about getting the display set up correctly and getting the um, getting the, uh, the getting the infrastructure and getting the individual components calibrated is is important as well. That brings up a good question. Where do you start? I mean, if you have a system that consists of a display and a receiver and a Blu-ray player, which one do you calibrate first and, and how should you do that? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about calibrating, um, you know, one source to uh, one TV. That's usually a simple setup, but then we'll talk a little bit more, more complex setups as well. So just an example of simple versus complex systems. This is stuff that we're seeing constantly. Uh, a simple system might be something like a 4K Apple TV to a 4K TV. That's easy. Uh, a couple of configure a couple of different things you have to do co for configuration, um, but not a big deal. You start looking down the list and you get to the uh, number seven, number six, and number seven on the list. You start talking about things like multiple resolutions to uh, 4K and 2K TVs. Maybe you have a system in a commercial environment where um, it's a 1080p infrastructure, uh, but there are some 4K displays around the building. Or maybe you have a full 4K system in a home, but maybe there's a 1080p TV out on the back patio by the pool. So how do we get a 2K signal to that TV in a completely 4K uh, system? So we'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, just a trip down memory lane here, if you will. I uh, just wanted to show off kind of some old, um, old legacy equipment that we used to use to calibrate systems and displays. Uh, in the middle, we have an old Sencor video generator. Uh, this, was the, uh, this was the generator to have. It was fantastic in its day. Uh, what you see on the left side of the screen is an old uh, display calibration kit made by Philips. That was about a $10,000 kit in its day. There's a signal generator on the left side of that picture and a, uh, light, uh, a light meter on the right side of that picture. And then on the far right side of the screen is just an old, um, old Color Pro 5 Sencor colorimeter. And these are the things that we used to use on a daily basis to, uh, to troubleshoot video signals and infrastructure and to calibrate some displays. And what we're dealing in 2018 are completely new tools. Uh, what you see on the left side of the screen in that example in the bottom is a Meridio 6G generator, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Uh, that's a complete, um, complete package when it comes to uh, 4K signals and HDR signals, even Dolby Vision, things like that. Uh, sort of in the middle of that picture, there's, um, there's a few different examples of some of the newer meters that we use to calibrate displays. Uh, on the right side, you see another signal generator, the Video Forge Pro, uh, which is another one that's available, um, and then uh, the SpectraCal C6 light meter. So these are just some of the newer tools that we need for some of the newer displays. And you know, we need tools that can allow us to troubleshoot 18 gig signals. We need meters that can read up to uh, eventually 10,000 nits if we're calibrating displays. So just a few examples there of um, of some of the newer equipment that we're using. And uh, I did mention in the slide too, uh, we are going to talk a little bit uh, later in the presentation about some different test patterns that we use to calibrate HDR and Dolby Vision. So first thing we'll talk about are some devices that we use to calibrate displays. Um, what you see typically in a normal calibration kit are some different light meters. Like for example, there's an i1 Pro 2 and a Klein K10. Down here, this blue box is a, it's called a Jetty. Uh, then on the right, we have the SpectraCal C6. And there is a difference between some of these meters. Some of them are called spectral devices. Some of them are called color emitters. And they both have their advantages. Uh, and there's pros and cons of each. Uh, spectral devices, for example, are very accurate. But sometimes they tend to be a little slow, especially if you're calibrating a projector and you're reading lower levels such as you know 5 IRE and 10 IRE and doing things like grayscale and white balance. Uh, those devices can be very accurate, but sometimes they're not as fast. And then you have some colorimeters that are just the opposite. They're really fast, but they're not as accurate. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, how can I get both? I want fast and accurate when I calibrate my displays, and that's a, that's a very valid question. Uh, you can be very fast and very accurate. It's just really expensive. But what if you could take a moderately priced meter and a moderately priced spectral device and use both? And you can do that. Uh, you can do that these days. You can use both meters. You can profile them together. Then you get the best of both worlds. You get the speed of the colorimeter, you get the accuracy of the spectral device, and everybody seems to be happy. Um, things that you've maybe seen in the past in your calibration kits, um, 
and you see this sometimes they'll, if you buy if you've ever bought like a calibration DVD before or blu-ray disc before they tend to come with uh, like a blue filter that you physically hold over your eyes when you're adjusting things like color and tint uh, those are old tools guys those are great for CRT displays they don't work so well for things like OLED and LED backlit LCDs as far as recalibration goes should you recalibrate your calibration equipment absolutely uh, color emitters especially they do tend to drift over time so keeping your gear up to date is just as important as keeping your displays up to date now, as far as uh, signal analyzers and generators go there's a couple of examples from Meridio that you see on the page here and the whole point of this is to teach you that for uh, troubleshooting current systems you need current tools so on the left side of the screen, you see the uh, the green and black boxes. That's called the Fox and the Hound kit. Uh, it comes with a signal generator that you see on the left side of the screen, and there's a signal analyzer that you see on the right side of the picture. So on, on this particular kit, let's say that you were troubleshooting a video system in a residential environment where all of the equipment was in a rack down in the basement, but you're trying to troubleshoot a display up in the bedroom. So instead of running up and down the stairs, you can hook up the generator analyzer on each end of the system, and you could look at the analyzer and see exactly what the signal is that's coming through the system, whether it's 4K or 1080p, whether it's 30 or 60 frames per second, or whatever the case is, this kit will do, will do that for you. Um, on the right side of the screen, you'll see the Meridio 6A and 6G kit. Now, there is a difference between these two kits. If you're calibrating displays, you'd want to go with the 6G slash 6A combination because the Fox and Hound kit is fantastic for troubleshooting, but it does not have any built-in um, any built-in calibration functionality. So, if you're troubleshooting systems, uh, the Fox and Hound kit is is a fantastic tool. If you're um, troubleshooting systems and calibrating displays, the Meridio 6A slash 6G combo would be the one to go with. And the picture in the middle there is just an example of the uh, the Meridio 6A analyzer. And on the next page, I want to show you uh, what that screen looks like when you are troubleshooting a system. So here's kind of a close-up look at uh, the 6A screen. And just to kind of give you an idea of what was going on here, um, we were looking at the data rate uh, or the bandwidth um, out of a Blu-ray player in this case. And, you know, right now we're dealing with an 18 gig infrastructure. And we have movies already that are kind of pushing those limits. So uh, this screenshot from the 6A analyzer was from the output of a Blu-ray player, and we were playing at the time a movie called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. And what that movie's kind of famous for is uh, it's an Ang Lee film, and he actually shot it at 60 frames per second. So we wanted to we wanted to verify that. So based off of what was coming out of the Blu-ray player with that movie playing, you'll see on the top line that we were you were dealing with 2160p, so that's 4K. We were dealing with 60 frames per second. There's our verification. We were dealing with 422 chroma subsampling, REC 2020 color space, HDMI connection, um, HDCP version 2.2, color depth was 8-bit. Now, if you add all these things together, well, minus the HDCP at least, but if you add all if you add all the specs together, check this, check this out, guys. It comes out to a bandwidth of 17.8 gigs, and the line just below shows you the H HDR metadata was present. So this is an HDR 4K 60 frames per second 422 8-bit signal with Rec 2020 color space. And if we're dealing with an 18 gig infrastructure, check this out. This was already 17.8 gigs. So we're already kind of pushing the limits uh, with certain movies at least with that 18 gig infrastructure. Now when we start dealing with HDMI 2.1 here real soon, we're gonna that's gonna be bumped up to 48 gigs. So we'll be dealing with a whole new um, a whole new slew of, of specs, like 8K, maybe 120 frames per second, all kinds of cool stuff. So um, again, this is just a screenshot. And, and the way we got this screenshot was literally plugging in the analyzer to the output of the Blu-ray player and, um, and just getting all the specs from there. Other tools that you might consider um, using are, are things like EDID minders. Um, we see this quite a bit in systems with mixed resolutions. So let's go back to that example that we talked about before, where you might have a 4K uh, video system, but there's one 1080p TV up in the master bedroom or up outside by the pool or something like that. How do we get 1080p to that TV, but 4K to all the other TVs that are throughout the house? 
So you might use something like a scaler or an eated minder to uh, to make that one display 1080p. Or if you go the opposite, you know maybe you have a 1080p infrastructure and the main TV in the living room or the main projector in the theater room is 4K. How do we get uh, 4K to that device but 1080p to all the other devices? And things like these eated managers and eated minders and scalers will will help you in those situations. Uh, something else that's really helped me um, help me in, in some older systems are things like a distribution amplifier. You see it listed here as a DA. Um, and the the situation that I ran into was the um, it was a residential environment, and the the homeowner had a, a brand new 4K TV, and he had a brand new 4K Blu-ray player. He'd also custom built a 4K uh, desktop computer that was part of the rack. Uh, the problem was, after a little bit of troubleshooting, we figured out that the receiver, the AVR, um, you know, that was handling all the audio and video signals. Well, unfortunately, the AVR was a couple of years old, and it was non-compliant. It would not pass the 4K HDR signal. So you really have to make a choice here, right? I mean, do I do I run all my video signals to the television and bypass the AVR for sound? I could use optical for sound, but I'm not going to get things like Dolby True HD and all my high resolution audio formats. The other thing I could do is run all my HDMI uh, components. I'm sorry, run all my HDMI the signals to the to the receiver, and then one output from the receiver to the TV. Now I'll have my high resolution sound formats. But because the receiver can't pass 4K HDR signals, I'm not going to get 4K HDR to the display. Well, what if there was a, what if there's something you could do to get both? What if you could get 4K HDR signal to the display, and you could also get high resolution sound through the receiver? There is a way to do that, and that's with the distribution amplifier. There's no need to sacrifice picture or sound. You can get the best of both worlds. So here's how this system ended up um, ended up looking at the end of the day. You'll notice that we have the AVR right in the middle of the screen. Uh, the TV is, is on the right side of the screen. And all of the devices are in a, on a rack that's on the left side of the screen. So you'll see that there was a set-top box, you know, a.k.a. a cable box. Uh, he did have a, a streaming device. There was a 4K PC in the mix that he had custom built. And there was a 4K UHD Blu-ray player. Now you'll notice there's a couple of little black boxes right here. And those are the distribution amplifiers. And they work as one input to output. And in this particular case, these distribution amplifiers were fully compliant with 18 gig signals. So if you look at what we ended up doing here, the set-top box was at 4K, so we weren't really too worried about that. So the set-top box still went to the receiver and eventually came out of the receiver into the television. But look at what we had to do with the streaming device and the 4K PC. Because these only had one HDMI output, we had to throw in this distribution amplifier in the mix and that split that HDMI signal off the two signals. So one signal could go straight to the TV to preserve the 4K HDR. One signal could go straight to the uh, AVR, and that would preserve all the HDMI, you know, high bandwidth audio formats. Rinse and repeat for the 4K uh, desktop computer. So you get the same thing there. Now, in this particular case, the 4K Blu-ray player got kind of lucky here. Uh, that one already had two HDMI outputs. So one was straight to the receiver for sound, one was straight to the TV for uh, for 4K HDR signals. Now, if you notice what's going on here is, you know, we, we did have to reconfigure the system quite a bit, and there maybe had to be a little bit of reprogramming to his uh, custom remote control, but because the system was set up like this for fairly, you know, not a lot of money at all, we were able to preserve the 4K HDR signals for a picture, and we were able to uh, preserve the 18 gig, I'm sorry, the, um, the high resolution, uh, sound formats for for the receiver as well now you know you have a couple options here these uh these distribution amplifiers are not terribly expensive you know one option would have been to replace the avr with something that was hdr and 4k compliant but in this particular case this was a very high-end very expensive receiver and the customer loved the way it sounded and he didn't want to go out and spend another five grand on another you know high-end receiver so this was kind of a good workaround that was budget friendly budget conscious uh, but also performance conscious as well. We got the best of both worlds with picture and sound and a uh, little bit of uh, reconfiguration in the system, but overall money-wise to buy a few more HDMI cables and to buy these distribution amplifiers wasn't terribly ex expensive at all. What about HDMI cables? Um, you know, we saw this a few years ago when we were dealing with 3D signals. Um, 
you know, you, you would need higher bandwidth HDMI cables to get 3D to play through the system. So, you know, maybe you bought that brand new Avatar movie on 3D and put it in your 3D Blu-ray player. And because your HDMI cables were a bit older, that high bandwidth 3D signal couldn't pass and you had no picture or you had no 3D, for example. And we're kind of seeing that again. You know, now we're dealing with even higher bandwidth at 18 gigs. And again, like you saw from that screenshot from the 6A before, you know, we're already pushing that bandwidth. We're already pushing it. So if you have some cables that are a bit longer or... Uh, or installed in such a way that um, you know maybe maybe there's there's a distance issue. Maybe you're dealing with a 50 foot HDMI cable. Uh, those don't always work well in 18 gig systems. You know that's a lot of bandwidth to travel 30, 40, 50 feet. So you know even when you're when you're building a system and you're designing the system, you have to consider the HDMI cables as well. And what we're seeing now are some 18 gig um, copper HDMI cables, just like traditional HDMI cables. And those, in my experience at least, work pretty well up to about 15, 20 feet or so in most cases. Uh, for longer distances, we're starting to see some um, active optical HDMI cables, which work really well. The actual video signals traveling down an optical path in this hybrid HDMI cable, whereas things like hot plug and, and HDCP are still traveling over copper. So really cool hybrid cable. We've seen those uh, more and more today. Uh, we're starting to see some uh, very reliable, very good 18 gig um, HDMI extenders or Balins. Um, those can be connected nowadays with a, a typical, you know, Cat5 or Cat6 LAN or Ethernet cable. Uh, we're also starting to see some 18 gig HDMI extenders that actually use fiber in between the transmitter and the receiver. So you're talking much more bandwidth and things like, um, you know, not having to worry about um, electromagnetic interference. You know, it, you could potentially run a fiber optic cable next to a, you know, next to a power cable, for example, and not have to worry about um, you know, messing up the audio signal. Um, and when you're going through an extender, you have to think also too about, about the system being compressed. And with most extenders, with all the extenders I can think of at least, when you're, when you're doing an 18 gig um, signal over a, say an ethernet cable, um, the systems do have, the signals do have to be compressed a little bit. So just be aware of that. Not a big deal, really, at the end of the day. Um, you know, just something to know and something to be aware of. Now, what you can do with something like the Meridio 6A and 6G is uh, this is a very helpful tool for you know, before the system goes in. So, you know, if you're specking out a system or installing a system and you're dealing with multiple long HDMI runs, you know, why not? It, it would be a... a very heartbreaking thing to happen if you found out that after the 30 foot HDMI cable was installed you know throughout the walls and whatnot come to find out that, that HDMI cable is no good or it can't pass an 18 gig signal why not find that stuff out before you install the in, install the HDMI cables so what you can do with the Meridio 6A and 6G or the Fox and the Hound is you can do what we call a cable test um, it's very simple uh, the output of the um, 6G generator, you connect your HDMI cable there. The other end of the HDMI cable would connect to the input of the 6A analyzer. And within the 6A analyzer, you flip through the menu and there's a, um, a submenu called cable test. You push OK and you'll see some data up on the screen. Now on the left side in this example that you're looking at right now, uh, you kind of see an example of a bad cable. So you'll notice on the top line, there's a five volt hot plug. And that, that communication did actually happen. So the cable was passing something. Um, when it came to the different data channels, whether it was uh, you know, 9 gig, 14 gig, 18 gig, whatever, notice how there were zero errors. That's a good sign. The DDC passed and the uh, hot plug detect, that also passed. So the left example, uh, I think I may have confused this a moment ago and said that this was an example of bad. This is actually an example of good. So the, the left picture is a cable test that was successful. We have communication on all channels and we have zero errors. On the right side of the screen, that's where you see the example of bad. So this one actually did pass the 5-volt hot plug signal. Oops, sorry. Uh, but you see data channels 0, 1, and 2, uh, those pass no signal. And then the DDC channel and the, H the hot plug detect channel also failed. So if I were to hook up an HDMI cable and get what I'm seeing on the right side of the screen now, where I have no signal and failures, I know that that cable is no good and I should not use that in my system. But if I get what's on the left side of the screen where I have OK, zero errors, and pass uh, on the two bottom lines, then I know that that cable is good to go. 
and I can go ahead and install it and um, and and not have to worry about it failing um, after all the components are hooked up. Now, one piece of advice that I, that I like to give people, and I kind of learned this over the years after installing systems and and upgrading those systems years later, is that you know if any opportunity comes to where you can run conduit, that's really the best way to do it. Um, that way, you know, nowadays we're talking about 18 gig HDMI cables. Well, a few years from now, we may be talking about, um, you know, 48 gig HDMI cables. So if you install a system today and go to upgrade it in five years, because now you're dealing with 8K and 120 frames per second and all kinds of cool new stuff, it's so much easier just to pull the new cable through the wall with the old cable if you have a piece of conduit installed. So just keep that in mind as you're specking out systems and designing systems. Conduit's going to be your friend, and it's going to really help you um, upgrade that system later when it comes time. All right, so after the components are installed, we'll talk a little bit about the process of making sure that, you know, not only are you getting the proper signal to the display, but all the components themselves are configured as well. And again, I, I mentioned this before, but... Um, a lot. This stuff these days is not really necessarily plug and play like it may have been a couple years ago. We do have to make sure that the the different components are configured correctly, um, so that, for example, the the edit of the TV asks the source for an HDR signal. If the TV's input's not set up correctly, uh, that might never happen. And the problem is, is that you plug in the 4K, um, you plug in the 4K Blu-ray player to the 4K TV, and you will get a picture. But if the system's not configured correctly, it won't be the best picture you could get. It won't be HDR, it won't be 4K. And the problem is, is that because you do get a picture, you figure, oh, this must be it. This must be correct. And it's not the best it could be. So I'll walk you through a couple different things here that'll, that'll help you ensure that that's happening correctly. So first thing we should do uh, when dealing with a system like this, update the firmware on everything. Next, we want to verify that every component in the system can handle 18 gigs. And that was the problem I ran into with this system, was that this receiver, even though it was only a couple of years old, it was right on the cusp of uh, you know, not being 4K and HDR. So go ahead and verify that all the devices in the system are 4K and HDR compliant. It could be a, as quick as a Google search or just checking the manual for, uh, for that specific device. Um, that includes uh, distribution amplifiers, splitters, switches, extenders, all kinds of things. For example, you may have an extender in the mix that's only rated for uh, you know 1080p, but the display, the receiver, the Blu-ray player has all been upgraded for 4K. Well, that one extender being in the system could still knock the system down to 1080p and and stop you from getting the best out of that system. Um, and then uh, then we want to verify that the display is configured for 4K and HDR. A couple things to note here, guys. Every manufacturer is a little bit different. Um, some manufacturers for 4K and HDR, you have to be plugged into a specific HDMI input. Um, some TVs, you have to have a specific setting turned on on that input, and some TVs, you have both. So on the next slide, we're going to look at four major brands and, and what to look for in those, in those different uh, televisions and displays. So Sony's, for example, not every single input on that TV or on that chassis is going to be 18 gig compliant. Um, in my experience, what I've seen so far, at least over here in the States, the TV may have four HDMI inputs. On, on Sony, for example, and HDMI 2 and 3 are compliant with 18 gig signals. Um, now, once you plug into the correct input, let's say it's input 2 or input 3, you have to go into a menu in the Sony TV and change the HDMI format from standard to enhanced. And you have to do that for each input that you want to be compatible with 18 gigs. I've got a picture of this on the next slide, so it'll make sense when you see the picture. On the LG, typically all of the inputs are 18 gig capable. But if you don't go into the general settings of the LG menu and turn on the HDMI deep color, then again, the TV's EDID will never ask the source for HDR and you'll never see it. Uh, with Vizio, uh, they're very similar to Sony. Not all of the inputs are 18 gig capable. You do have to go into the Vizio menu and you have to turn on what they call full UHD color for each input that you want to use for 18 gigs. Samsung's, uh, typically all the inputs are 18 gig capable but you have to go into the menu and you have to turn on what they call HDMI UHD color for each one of the inputs that you want to use. And if you're ever not sure, um, this information is pretty easy to find if you, if you check the owner's manual sometimes. Um, if, and if you're ever not sure, if you can't find it in the owner's manual or if the owner's manual is uh, very vague or doesn't give you a good idea, you can always give us a call at Meridio. And uh, you know we've, we've done a lot of this testing. We have a lot of these displays in our own lab. 
So uh, give us a call. We may know the information off the top of our heads. But if you're not sure, give us a call. So here's a couple of screenshots of what we just talked about. So you'll notice on the left side of the screen, that's an example of an LG 55-inch C7, the 2017 OLED. And uh, this is under the general settings menu. So you'll notice that uh, HDMI 2 is the one that's turned on. And in this particular situation, we were using HDMI 2 for 4K UHD. So there's really no need to turn on HDMI 1s, 3, and 4. Could if you wanted to, if you were going to plug into those later, that's no big deal. But you do have to turn this on. Uh, the middle example is from a Sony. Um, the factory default, you'll notice the top line says standard format. That's the factory default. You have to go in and you have to turn on the enhanced format. Um, and you can even see here in the little description, it, it specifically calls out uh, HDMI inputs 2 and 3. That could be different on European models. I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you. But again, if you check the owner's manual, read the description inside the TV's menu, it should tell you. And I even see on some TVs, uh, let's say there's four HDMI inputs on the back of the TV. Um, sometimes the HDMI inputs will actually be labeled or a different color to, to, um, to kind of give you a clue that those are the inputs to use for 18 gigs. The example that you see on the right side of the screen is from a Samsung TV. You'll notice that we're in the HDMI UHD color menu. And in this particular situation, we were using all, H all four HDMI inputs, so we checked all four of those. So again, sometimes it's a matter of being in the right input. Sometimes it's a matter of turning on a feature like HDMI UHD color in the Samsung. And sometimes it's like the Sony in the middle where you have to do both. You have to be conscious of the input that you're plugged into, and you also have to change the setting uh, in the television as well. So just a couple of examples there. Okay. So in a system that you're going to be calibrating, we talked earlier about there may be you know, several different components in the system, and you're there to calibrate the system, and you, know, you may ask yourself, okay, well, where do I start? You know, I've got six or seven components I have to worry about. Which one do I do first? Which one do I do last? That's a good question. Um, and what I've seen in my experience uh, for, for the last 10 years is um, I, I typically will calibrate the display first, bypassing the receiver, bypassing the components. My Meridio 6G generator is plugged directly into the display. Um, once the generator is hooked up to the display, you can go ahead and hook up your, uh, your light meter or light meters if you're do doing some profiling. Um, you want to go ahead and position those light meters in the correct position on the display. And um, then you can go ahead and, and use your software, maybe it's Calman or Light Illusion or whatever you like to use, and you're ready to set up, uh, I'm sorry, you're ready to calibrate the display. Um, a couple of things just to kind of point out here. Uh, you'll notice on the left side of the screen that, that first example, that first picture, um, that shows you the setup of a i1 Pro 2 spectral device, uh, which I was using that to profile the SpectraCal C6 that you see on the left side of, the, of that picture. Um, and then once the C6 was profiled, I could take the i1 Pro 2, put it back in my in its case, and not have to worry about it for the rest of that job. And I could just use the C6 from there. What you see in the middle picture is kind of the same. That's just the setup on a flat panel. You'll notice on the flat panel that the meters are kind of right next to each other, and they're right in the middle of the screen. Uh, on the left picture for, for projector, you'll notice that the two meters are on a tripod, and uh, they're about you know four to six inches from the screen, facing the screen. And you'll notice, too, that they're, uh, they're at a slight angle, maybe a 30 or 40, 45 degree angle there or so. If you, if you have those meters positioned to where they're perfectly perpendicular with the screen, the problem is, is now you have a projector shining light onto the meter, and that's going to cast a shadow onto the screen, and you end up reading the shadow, and your readings are inaccurate or all over the place. So if you are setting up for a projector, um, like I said, get those meters a couple inches, a few inches, like I said, about six to eight or so inches away from the screen. Make sure the meter is facing the screen because the screen is part of the system and um, about a 45 degree angle or so should do it. Again, the middle picture for the flat panels, um, you know, they can be next to each other. That's no big deal. And uh, what you see on the right side of the screen is a, a Klein K10. That was after it had been profiled to an i1 Pro 2. The i1 Pro 2 had gone back into its case and for the rest of that job, just using the Klein K10 on a tripod. We're not going to talk too much about calibrating SDR just because uh, that's not really the purpose of this webinar. And plus, we've been doing SDR calibration now for, you know, since the 90s. And I think we pretty much got it figured out at this point. But we will talk quite a bit about HDR. So 
once you calibrate the the SDR, the standard dynamic range side of the TV, uh, you do have to calibrate the HDR side of the TV separately. And when I say side of the TV, just something I've kind of said now over the past couple of years. But what I mean by that is you're almost doing two calibrations for one TV nowadays because you calibrate the standard dynamic range, then you calibrate the high dynamic range. And what you'll notice with a lot of TVs is when you're feeding the TV a normal 1080p standard dynamic range signal, you'll see all your different picture modes that you've seen over the years and what you're used to, you know, vivid, standard, custom, expert, you know, one, expert two, whatever the case is. But when you feed the display an HDR signal, you'll have a whole new slew, a whole new choice uh, of different picture modes to pick from. So maybe you'll have HDR vivid, HDR custom, HDR cinema. Those are just some examples. If you feed the TV a Dolby Vision signal, you may have a whole new set of presets and picture modes and settings. So you may have Dolby Vision Vivid, Dolby Vision Cinema, things like that. Um, some TVs are not like that. So some TVs, you may have to use two different picture modes. So for example, um, on Sony's, you may use Cinema Home as your HDR calibration and HDR settings. You may use Cinema as your SDR, your 1080p signals and 1080p picture mode. Uh, and the user end user would have to change picture modes based off what they were watching in that case, but at least at least you can calibrate both modes. And in the other case I talked about before was uh, I was thinking about an LG TV, where the LG TV does switch automatically to HDR or SDR based off the um, the signal you're feeding it, and the user doesn't have to do anything. And what you'll notice on any in any case for either method, when you do give the TV an HDR signal, in most cases you will see the t the TV will let you know. You'll see in the upper right corner, for example, an HDR logo or a Dolby Vision logo. And that way you know that the TV is getting Dolby Vision. So either the picture mode will switch automatically for you, or you can grab the remote and switch the picture mode manually. It all depends on the TV. And like I said before, they're all a little bit different. Um, what about calibrating HDR10? You know, there, there's some things I'll go over with you here to help you do that. Calibrating Dolby Vision is still in its infancy. Most of this is in, in its infancy, but Dolby Vision especially. Um, do you have to calibrate just one of those modes? Do you have to calibrate both of those modes? Again, it all depends on the TV. Um, what about the internal apps of the television? Uh, that's a big that's a big thing right now, guys, because I've even done this uh, kind of experiment myself. And you know, think about where you get your streaming sources from. So let's say let's use Netflix as an example. You have so many different options you can get Netflix from. Uh, you might be able to get it from the Blu-ray player. You might be able to get Netflix from a device such as a Chromecast or a Roku or an Apple TV, some streaming device. You may also be able to get Netflix from the internal app uh, built into the TV. And what I've noticed over the years, um, and I've done this experiment myself, it seems to me that when I use the uh, when I use the internal app, that one that's built into the television, it seems to me that the picture tends to be a bit more crisp. Um, I see like less compression artifacts. Just has a little more pop to it. it. Just seems to be a little more, a little more pure, a little more pristine of a of a signal. Uh, the noise is something that I can. I'm very sensitive to for some reason, and I notice there's much less noise if I use the Netflix app built into the TV, for example. So how do you calibrate those internal apps, right? Because there's no way to hook up the 6G generator uh, to the internal, you know, processing into the internal apps of the TV. So I'll give you some tips on how to do that too. One thing to know about HDR calibration, it's all based on the display's capabilities. It's not relative like it was with standard dynamic range. So, um, you know, you may see a movie, and this is very common nowadays, but you, you see movies that are uh, mastered in HDR for 1,000 nits or 4,000 nits, and there's even a couple movies now that are mastered for 10,000 nits. Well, what if you have a display that can only reach about, I don't know, seven, 800 nits? What happens to all that data from 800 nits to 1,000 nits? Or, 800 nits to 4,000 nits. Well, the display manufacturers have a choice to make. They could either they could either show you all 4,000 nits and those highlights and 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 those those details that you might see in like a bright cloud on a sunny day. Those details are just completely lost. And nobody wants to do that. We want we want a picture with a lot of detail in it. So in order to pres to preserve those specular highlights, in order to preserve those really bright details in a in a picture the TV will do something called tone mapping. Now, the the brightest details, if they're mastered at 1,000 nits, they're obviously not going to be shown at 1,000 nits because the TV can't do it, but those bright details will be shown at the brightest that the TV can show them. So maybe it's 800 nits because that's all the TV can do. 
the nice thing about that is all of the details in the picture and all of the data and the metadata and stuff is preserved. So you are still seeing everything that you're supposed to see. It's just not as bright as it possibly could be. And eventually what we'll see uh, soon, I think, and this actually was displayed at CES in Las Vegas this year, um, there was a manufacturer that did have a 10,000 nit display. They were showing 10,000 nit content. So no extra processing had to happen, no tone mapping had to happen. And unfortunately I didn't get to see this with my own eyes, but it's almost like listening to a full range speaker with no crossover that can actually do full range. So I bet it looked really cool. Um, and I think we'll start to see that soon. Um, you know, with the way that displays are going right now, you know, hitting a thousand nits and, and even 4,000 nits should be uh, fairly, I would think easy in the next few years. So look out for that stuff. So if you are going to calibrate HDR on a display, uh, there's a very specific way you have to set up the Meridio 6G generator. Um, and you'll notice a few different settings I have here I want to call out and show you guys. So you notice that the window size is a 10% window. That's typically what most calibrators use when they're calibrating HDR. Um, that just gives us a standard because if we didn't do that as a standard, and you're talking about things like maximum light output in nits. Well, if you're using full field patterns, you'll have less nits on an OLED than if you're using 10% windows. So if we didn't have this kind of 10% window rule established, it'd be a little chaotic if you're a TV reviewer, for example. One reviewer might say this TV is 1,000 nits. One reviewer might say this TV is 4,000 nits or 3,500 nits, for example. But how they got that measurement is not really standardized. Um, and we're trying to do our best to sort of standardize that in a, in a kind of an unofficial way. So um, try to stick with 10% windows. You get more consistent readings that way. Um, it's, it's not a bad idea to check things like OLEDs and plasmas with a full field just to check for things like uniformity and burn-in and stuff like that. Um, you can also, uh, you know, if you're looking at things like local dimming on an LCD, you can use full fields to kind of see, you know, check for uniformity. Actually calibrating, um, try to stick with those 10% windows. The other thing that you'll see too is that the resolution is set to 2160p. I just picked 24 frames per second. because That's typically what most Hollywood movies are. The color format is RGB limited. The bit depth is set to eight. And I've gotten this question before. Why not use 10 bit if those uh, some of those movies and some of those signals are 10 bit signals? Uh, it's a great question and it does make sense. Uh, just from what I've noticed in my own testing and my own experimenting is that if you're doing something like grayscale or color management in the display, whether you're sending it a 10 bit or eight bit test pattern, that's not going to affect things like grayscale and color management. So, um, you know, if you're gonna check for things like color banding and, and stuff like that, then sure, go ahead and use 10 bit, that's fine. But from what I've found so far, it doesn't really matter what bit depth you use when you're calibrating. You'll notice that the HDR, there is a drop down screen here. Um, you can pick either HDR 10 or Dolby Vision. So you wanna, you want to, um, you know, pick the right one for the situation that you're in. And then uh, this is a new thing. This is this is something that uh, is, is new to the calibration world and new to displays. We have something called EOTF, electro optical transfer function. Uh, what we used to, we used to kind of use this um, on standard dynamic range TVs as something that we called gamma. Um, gamma is all relative. It all depends on the room that you're in. Um, it, all, it all depends on where the customer is sitting. It all depends on room lighting. Um, everything, everything matters in, in that sense. In EOTF, um, in HDR especially, it's not relative. Everything is fixed. So we want to make sure that we're tracking the EOTF correctly, just like we want to track the gamma correctly based on the room lighting. And the EOTF that we use for HDR is called ST2084. So go ahead and set that in your generator. Uh, we want to set the display primaries to Rec 2020 because that's what the content uh, some of the content is mastered in, but we're still dealing with a Rec 2020 color space. And regardless of what color space you're using, the um, D65 is still going to be our white point. That's true no matter if it's 4K, HDR, SDR, photography, game design, television production, film production. Uh, we're always going to use D65 as our white point. The other thing I want to call out too, um, and I don't think I have a screenshot for it, but you can do this in the settings for CalMAM. Uh, what we've primarily used for a delta error formula for, for years now is something called Delta E2000. Um, what we found uh, with some testing is that it's not exactly precise enough and doesn't give us enough, uh, it just doesn't give us enough for high dynamic range and um, 
and wide color gamut. So instead of using Delta E2000 as your Delta formula, we want to use a new Delta formula called ICTCP, and you can change that in the uh, you can change that in the Calman settings um, in the upper right corner. You'll see a, a settings wheel, and uh, you can change that in Calman. Now, when you're calibrating uh, HDR, um, there's a couple of different workflows that you can use. There are specific HDR uh, HDR10 and Dolby Vision workflows inside of Calman. But there's also an analysis workflow too. And I kind of like, excuse me, I kind of like to use both. Um, the whole point of the analysis workflow is to just really just test that TV or that display's capabilities. You know, if we're doing something like Rec 2020 color space or P3 color space, the analysis workflow will kind of give you an idea of what that TV is capable of, you know, color wise. So if you take a look at the left example, you'll notice that uh, we were checking this TV for P3 color gamut. How much of P3 could this television cover? Um, now to be compliant and to get that UHD Alliance certification, the TV has to do at least 92% of P3. And what you'll notice on this particular display, depending on the color space that you're dealing with, whether it's 1931 or 1976, either way, this TV passed that 92% no problem. If we're using the 1931 formula, we were at 95.9% .9 of P3. If we're dealing with the 1976 formula, we were 98% of P3. So depending on the formula that you're using, we were well past the 92%. So this TV, um, if you're a manufacturer, if you're just testing this TV's capabilities and potential, uh, safe to say that this TV will, will show some really good HDR and white color gamut pictures. On the right side of the screen, you'll see that same analysis test, but uh, this is talking about specifically Rec 2020. And Rec 2020 is funny because it's kind of the end goal. We really don't have any displays right now that can really even come close, but we do want to test because eventually we will have displays that can do Rec 2020. So where this display produced you know, 95% of P3 in the 1931 color formula, it's only doing 70% of Rec 2020 in that same 1931 uh, formula. And you'll notice if you can see this, I'm not sure how well it shows up on your screen, but on the P3 graphs, you'll see that you know, your green primary, your red primary, your blue primary are all pretty close to the targets. If the green primary had been a little bit taller and had been in the dot, we probably would have been closer to you know, 97, 98, 99%. Uh, but look at where the dots land in 2020. You know, the target for green is way out here, but the TV is actually producing green here. So you'll see there's a lot of green missing. You'll see the lot with cyan, you'll see the same thing, magenta, red. I know it's really hard to see blue, but um, again, this just shows you the potential and shows you exactly how much of 2020 this particular display was covering. We're really just trying to find out how close. The analysis workflow is not for calibration, it's just for analysis, so keep that in mind. Now, if you are going to use the calibration workflow and actually calibrate the HDR, there's a couple of things that I want to point out that are really important right away. What's very important to get correct in HDR is the EOTF, what we talked about before, what, what used to be called gamma. And again, gamma, gamma is a relative thing. We would use one gamma setting for one room. We'd use another gamma setting for another room. And it was kind of a judgment call. It was up to the calibrator. With HDR, it's a little bit different. These are all fixed values. So what this graph is showing us this is the EOTF line. And what we're seeing is the, the Y coordinate, are uh, that's your luminance, that's your light output. So we go from about 200 nits to about 800 nits where this particular TV topped out. Across the X axis, you have your different levels throughout the grayscale. So 10%, 20%, all the way up to 100% white. Now look at how this graph works. The yellow line is our target. That would mean that the EOTF is, is calibrated correctly, and that's our reference line. And you'll notice that the gray line is actually where the TV is measured at. So for example, um, you know, look at where 10% gray or 10 IRE looks like it should be about 100 nits, according to the yellow line. But realistically, it looks like it's about maybe 180 nits. So that means that 10% in the gray scale is too bright. And you'll see that kind of stay the same up until you get to about 50 IRE. So the whole first half of the grayscale is too bright. 
and that can cause some really weird things in the picture. You know, if you were to look at, um, if you were to look at something, let's we'll see. Let's say about 50 IRE. That might be, that might be, uh, hmm, that might be like the snow on a cloudy day in um, like a, a nature documentary, for example. So those those darker shadows of the clouds and the snow are too bright, and they might look blown out. So that could be a problem. That could affect the picture quality quite a bit. Now, what you'll notice on the right side of the screen is the gray line now tracks much closer to the target, to the EOTF target. Now this didn't take some calibration wizardry or some black magic or anything like that. And that was really, you know, when I first started calibrating HDR, it was a little scary because it was it was brand new and it was different, and you kind of had to look at it from a completely different, completely new point of view. Now the reason I was able to get the EOTF to track so closely, all I had to do here, guys, was I had to pick a better a better picture mode out of the box. So for example, the left side of the screen that may have been HDR standard as a preset picture mode. Whereas on the right side of the screen, that may have been HDR cinema as a picture mode. So you can make a huge improvement to the picture just by picking a better picture mode. So what you may do when you're calibrating, measure all of the picture modes that the TV has to offer in HDR, and just simply pick the one that close that one that closely, uh, the closest one that follows the EOTF line. So just picking a better picture mode out of the box is going to give you a much better experience. What about different test patterns for brightness and contrast and things like that? What about different test patterns for Dolby Vision and HDR10? We are starting to see this now. Now, we have to be very careful of in HDR. We talked earlier about tone mapping. Tone mapping is really, really important because if the TV doesn't do any tone mapping or if it does the tone mapping wrong, you will see some things like blown out highlights. You may lose shadow details. All kinds of really weird stuff can happen if the tone mapping isn't, isn't tracking correctly. So. One thing with HDR that I found so far, and a lot of other calibrators are doing this too, you don't necessarily need to touch the brightness and contrast controls in HDR. Same thing with things like color and tint. If you turn the brightness up a little bit or turn the contrast down a little bit, you will throw off this EOTF line. So because these are fixed values and the metadata in the movie is telling the TV what to display, there's really no reason to raise the brightness or lower the brightness or raise or lower the contrast either. But what you might want to do is raise or lower the backlight or the OLED light for overall light output. You know, if you were to put in a very bright movie in HDR, you know, and the client was watching that in a dark room, we don't want the client to have a headache after after watching a movie. And at the same time too, if the if the room is bright, we don't want to have to have them, you know, squint to to see shadow details in dark parts of the of the movie and things like that. So the test pattern on the left is great for HDR. Um, you'll notice that it's split into kind of a grayscale. So black starts here, goes all the way through to peak white. And you notice there's a couple of little uh, indicators or markers here. So you notice there's a yellow line here for black. So everything from the beginning where black starts to that yellow line should be black. And you should start to see some gray just after the yellow line. Now, if you go through the grayscale down to this first marker, second marker technically, this is 100 nits. So what you want to do in this situation is aim your light meter to this gray circle in the middle of the test pattern, and you want to adjust your OLED light or your backlight in the display till that center circle reads 100 nits. That way you're not going to have to worry about making the picture too bright for somebody in a dark room especially with HDR with with as bright as some of these TVs can get with certain highlights like headlights on a car or a flashlight in a dark cave or something like that. Um, and as the, the grayscale continues on, you'll see there's another marker here for 500 nits. Um, there's another marker here for 1,000. There's another marker here for 5,000. So basically what you'll see, let's say the TV is only capable of 800 nits. You won't see any details past you know somewhere in here somewhere between 500 and 1,000. If you had a TV that could read all the way up to, or display all the way up to 5,000 nits, you would see details all the way up until this yellow line. So this test pattern is a little bit of, a, it is used for calibration in a sense that you're calibrating the backlight or the OLED light, but this really is just more of an analysis test pattern than anything, because it'll show you how, uh, how bright the TV is getting with certain highlights. On the right side of the screen, you'll see a Adobe Vision check pattern. So if you were to send this test pattern to a television 
you weren't sure if the, if the television was capable of Dolby Vision or not. Um, in this particular case, this TV was not. You'll notice there's no check mark at Dolby Vision. There's a check mark at SDR. If I were to look at the same test pattern on a TV that was Dolby Vision capable, there would be a check mark up here. So a couple of quick test patterns. Uh, we do have these at Meridio. Uh, these are not, uh, at least the one on the left is not a factory installed test pattern on the 6G generator. But uh, I have it. We, we do house it at Meridio. So if you're interested in that test pattern, we'd be more than happy to email it to you. And you can uh, upload it to your 6G generator with the uh, with the free software for the 6G. Um, so after you pick the the best picture mode for the EOTF tracking on that TV, we do still have to do things like white balance. You know, we don't have to adjust color and tint and brightness and contrast, and, and there is no gamma setting in HDR. But what you still want to do is make sure that um, you know white and gray is the correct white and gray. So we still want to calibrate the grayscale to D65. Um, and what you notice on a lot of TVs now, you may have a two-point white balance adjustment. You may also have a 20-point white balance adjustment, or some manufacturers give a 10-point. So you may have multiple ways to calibrate the, the grayscale. And that's all going to be basically what you're used to now if you've been calibrating TVs uh, recently, is we still want to do a two-point white balance calibration, and then we want to spot check the entire grayscale with a, a 10 or a 20-point. But what I've noticed in a lot of the newer TVs in HDR, a couple of things. The white balance and CMS controls are very, very touchy. So you might take out, say, for example, one click of blue from the grayscale, and now the grayscale has literally no blue in it after just one click. So sometimes the controls aren't as fine as you'd like them to be. So be very careful of that. What I've also noticed is that after doing a two-point white balance calibration, typically the whole grayscale is under control. So you may not need the 10-point or the 20-point. It's always good to check anyway. The same thing also applies on the color management um, adjustments as well. You may notice on color management, if you make one adjustment, make one click, your graph or, or your whatever you're aiming for may be way off target now instead of being kind of close like it was before. So just be very careful of these adjustments. Some of them can make major changes in what you're trying to do, um, but you still should be able to at least get a good grayscale. And what I found a lot of TVs in recent years anyway, is that if you do get a good grayscale calibration on that display, the primary and secondary colors tend to land in a pretty good spot, but some TVs don't even give us CMS or white balance controls in HDR anyway, so it's all gonna be depending on the manufacturer and the display that you're working on. But if the display does give you full controls, um, you know, definitely, definitely white balance the HDR, and that'll get rid of excess blue or green or red or, or whatever might be happening in that grayscale. Okay, so we're also learning about some new features in, th in, in some of the programs like CalMan with auto calibration. So when it comes to doing things like 20 point grayscale or color management, instead of the calibrator, you know, grabbing the remote, going into the menu and doing all these adjustments manually, CalMan can talk directly to the display and make these adjustments for you, which is really cool. So for the newer displays, what we're seeing on the 2018 LG line, not just their OLEDs, not just their flagship TVs, but the full 2018 LG TV line is going to be compatible with AutoCal. Two, and Samsung TVs, 2017 and going forward, are also going to be compatible with AutoCal. And you will see in the newest version of CalMan, at least, there are some specific workflows for LG 2018 models. Instead of just picking a generic like ISF workflow, for example, uh, you can pick a specific LG workflow. and um, that workflow, everything in that workflow would just per pertain to that LG TV. Uh, to the LG TVs, you will talk to that TV with CalMan via IP control. Um, I'm going to find out Friday. I'm, I'm working on my first 2018 LG on Friday. Uh, rumor has it that you can do that over Wi-Fi. Um, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take myself probably a 10 or 15 foot Ethernet cable just just to be safe because I may have to plug directly into the TV. Uh, it'd be really cool if it could happen over Wi-Fi, but we'll see. Um, for Samsung TVs, um, instead of communicating to the TV over IP, there are a couple of adapters that you need. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of those on the next page, so don't worry about memorizing this at the moment. But the first adapter that you need is USB to serial. The second adapter that you need is serial to 3.5 millimeter. It looks like a little headphone jack. You combine those two adapters together for one big adapter. And what you want to do is with the adapter that you just made, one end is going to plug into your laptop. The other end, the 3.5 millimeter end, is going to plug into the EX Link connector 
on the Samsung One Connect box. So now that uh, Calman software can talk directly to the Samsung TV, and I can do things like uh, automatic calibration of the grayscale and color management, and that does work both in SDR and HDR. Um, this will save you potentially time. It'll make the calibration a bit faster. So instead of um, you know instead of spending 20, 30 minutes on a 20 point white balance and really getting it nailed and, and really getting it perfect, um, the computer will take over, your laptop will take over, and Calman will control the TV. It's really cool. So a couple of pro tips uh, about calibrating HDR specifically. Um, this this took me a lot of trial and error to find out th this very simple thing, but the hardest part about calibrating HDR is getting HDR to the display and setting up the 6G correctly. If we're not getting HDR to the display, the display is never going to give us HDR picture modes, for example. So we got to make sure that's done first. We talked earlier about infrastructure and how to make that happen on all your jobs. Uh, we also have to make sure we're setting up the 6G correctly. If the 6G isn't configured for HDR, the TV will never trigger into HDR, and I can never access the HDR picture controls. So getting the HDR to the display, getting the 6G set up correctly, that's really the hardest part. Other than that, calibrating HDR, not a big deal. We're not really adjusting many things other than the grayscale and maybe the color management a little bit. Uh, for Dolby Vision calibration, on the 2017 LGs, you will need a USB thumb drive in order to calibrate Dolby Vision. Don't let it sound scary or confusing. Um, Calman does walk you through the entire process. So basically, Calman is going to figure out what those what that TV's capabilities are, and it's going to make a config file that you would transfer to a thumb drive. Once you pop that thumb drive into the LG TV and play a piece of Dolby Vision content, a message pops up on the TV screen and says, hey, we recognize a new config file for Dolby Vision. Do you want to use it? And it knew that because the thumb drive was plugged into the TV. So you would tell the TV yes. Um, the config file would load into the TV, and now the TV is calibrated for Dolby Vision. But again, don't let it sound scary. Uh, Calman does walk you through it. Now, the nice thing is on the 2018 models, because Calman can talk directly to the television, you don't have to do this whole thing with a thumb drive. It does it all for you automatically. It's really cool. Um, if you're calibrating an LG OLED, some things I found with some experience and the fact that I own this TV, a couple things that I found so far, um, whether you're calibrating Dolby Vision or HDR, um, cinema seems to be the mode that gives us the most accurate EOTF tracking, uh, the most accurate colors, the most accurate grayscale, just right out of the box. You will notice that cinema home is a little bit brighter, but because of the way the EOTF tracks, you will lose some bright details. Again, like a cloud in the sky might be blown out instead of seeing all the details in that cloud. Uh, but cinema home is brighter. So if you're dealing with a bright living room or maybe have somebody who lives on a, on a, on a, in a, in a you know, condo with giant windows, you may want to consider using Cinema Home as kind of your day mode for HDR. Um, I mentioned this before, Sony doesn't have separate picture modes for HDR, so you might want to consider using uh, Expert 1 for SDR and Expert 2 for HDR, for example. Any combination that's that's good for you works. Whatever works for you is best. Um, now, we talked earlier about the process of calibrating the system. What do you calibrate first? What do you calibrate last? What about in between? We talked earlier about plugging the Meridio generator into the display first then you wanna work your way backwards. So let's say we have a system that has a Blu-ray player, uh, we'll keep it simple, a Blu-ray player, a receiver, and a television. So first the generator, the 6G generator is plugged directly into the display, we calibrate the display. Then I can plug the 6G generator into an input on the AVR, and I can run some test patterns and look at some, look at some graphs. If everything looks okay, then that's a good thing. That means that the receiver is not distorting or, or changing the, the picture at all, which is really what you want. Um, in fact, what you may want to start consider doing, uh, just as a general thing, you'll notice with a lot of AV receivers, if you go into the the settings for the output, uh, where you can change the output of the of the receiver itself, sometimes you'll see options like you know 4K, 1080P, blah blah blah. But sometimes you'll see something called pass through or native. Um, typically, what that means is the signal that comes in is the exact same signal that comes out. The video signal, quote unquote, passes through untouched. And that's really what you want. There's nothing more annoying than spending all this time calibrating the TV just to find out that the receiver is crushing your shadow details or clipping your white details or something like that. Now, if something like that does happen, you can go back to the example we looked at before where we were using a distribution amplifier to get the video signal around the receiver. So there's always an, there's always to you and um, 
you know, and, and, and how, how elaborate or how simple you want the system to be. So kind of wrapping up, um, we talk a lot about this uh, in, in a sense because, you know, it, if, you're, if you come from a calibration standpoint or a calibration background, you didn't really have to worry too much before about things like EDID and, and um, color space and, and color subsampling and all these things. And now you kind of have to do, um, you, you kind of have to know these things as a calibrator. If you come from an integrator or an installer background and you're just learning calibration, you know, it's same thing. You kind of have to know everything about the system. It's not just calibrating the display. It's not just plugging in components and getting out of there because the calibrator is coming late, later. Um, display calibration has really morphed into a system calibration. Um, so just be aware of that, guys. Everything matters in 18 gig infrastructure, even like we said before, down to your extenders and your HDMI cables themselves. Uh, correct tools and good tools are more essential than ever. Uh, having things like the Fox and the Hound to let you troubleshoot infrastructure and to look at test patterns and to, to analyze the signal, um, you know, this stuff cuts down your troubleshooting time significantly. I had a, a, a private client I was working with recently and um, there was uh, something up with this Blu-ray player. It wasn't outputting correctly. And instead of spending, you know, 20, 30 minutes troubleshooting it, I plugged the analyzer into the output of the Blu-ray player. And within 60 to 90 seconds, we knew what was going on and we knew how to fix it. So, you know, think about these jobs and, and, and how much time you spend troubleshooting. You know, add that up every week, every month, every year. And these troubleshooting tools will pay for themselves rather quickly. Um, you may want to consider things like scalers and eater, EDID managers. We talked a lot about distribution amplifiers before. Uh, those kinds of tools will help you in, in jobs that are that you're retrofitting or jobs with older infrastructure. Um, again, I'll, I'll say this repeatedly that everything matters in the 18 gig infrastructure, even even down to your HDMI cables. Um, and guys, a lot of this HDR stuff, especially, it's still new. It's still even new to me. I mean, I I've been doing this for 10 years. And I, I feel like I learn new stuff every day. And a lot of it's in its, in its infancy. And, you know, it, it, if you've been around this business for a while, you start to notice that some of this stuff is cyclical. It, it all goes in a big circle. So we're dealing with bandwidth issues with 1080p. And then we were dealing with bandwidth issues with 3D. Now we're dealing with bandwidth issues on, on uh, you know, 18 gigs and HDR and, and 4K and stuff. And don't think this is the end of it. I mean, HDMI 2.1 is right around the corner. Now we're going to be dealing with 48 gig infrastructure. So. Doing things like running conduit and fiber, uh, those are really going to help you with, with future-proofing your jobs. And last but not least, I've got a website up here. If you want to check out the Meridio 6A or 6G um, you know, calibration slash troubleshooting package, picture of it there on the left side of the screen, uh, that would be the solution I would go with if I was both installing and calibrating. Uh, but if you're just installing, you're not doing any calibration work, you can get away with the kit on the right, and that is the Meridio um, Fox and Hound kit. Uh, great little kit. Those tools are, are very easy to hold in your hand. They're very lightweight, rechargeable batteries, so you don't have to have them plugged in all the time. Easy to read, easy to use buttons right on the front. Um, and for any support that you guys uh, would ever need, um, whether you have questions about the product itself or, or if you're troubleshooting a system and, and you want to learn how to use the tools um, to their full potential, uh, we're always here for you. Um, you could always reach us at um, at Meridio. Um, if you'd like to email me directly at any point, um, my email address is jason at avproglobal.com. But if you give us a call, anybody would be happy to help you. So that wraps up the um, the webinar for today. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I don't see any questions right away in the question box, but um, if any do come up, if Tom points out any to me, I'll email you guys individually and answer those questions for you. So uh, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day and let us know how we can help. Thanks.